Thanks to um, everyone who's joined the webinar and um, it's the first time I've actually used this platform so uh, hopefully you'll bear with me throughout, throughout the, um, the presentation I'll give. So I just wanted to go through and talk a little bit about I guess the NIFIC. Um, uh, we, we've certainly, um, you know, recent announcements over the weekend, the NIFIC is probably gaining a lot more prominence I guess in terms of, of our role um, and it's obviously an evolving role but I just thought it'd be useful to um, uh, go through, I guess, the key objectives behind uh, the NIFIX establishment, uh, talk about the key, key functions that the, um, that the NIFIC has um, uh, been asked to deliver, and then maybe some of the early feedback just in terms of how things are, are operating. So I guess just to quickly recap in terms of the motivation for setting up the, um, the NIFIC, uh, I guess a lot of it has been driven by um, issues relating to housing affordability, um, in particular the rental side of the of the market. Um, when you look at the numbers in terms of uh, rental stress, particularly for low income earners, growing wait lists um, for for subsidised housing, growing numbers of homelessness. I think the government um, at the time decided that. Um, they need to do more in this space. And we were part of a broader housing package that was announced by the government back in 2017. Um, and, and I guess the NIFIC is, is one part of that package, but I should say up front, you know, the NIFIC by itself is not going to fix um, all of the problems associated with the housing market. Um, there's a whole range of issues across local government, state government, Commonwealth government that I guess need to be addressed in a compre comprehensive way. Um, the CHP sector has said a lot to, you know, have said this repeatedly and, and we certainly acknowledge it, but we do think that um, the, um, uh, the offering that we have does actually go some way, a substantial way in terms of um, addressing some of those underlying um, problems. So in terms of, um, uh, I guess, the approach that the Commonwealth or the government has taken with respect to um, uh, the NIFIC, so these problems have been growing over time. Um, I guess the traditional way to support housing from the Commonwealth point of view has been, the, uh, particularly for the subsidised housing, has been um, through provision of funding to the um, to the states. Um, what we've what the NIF, what the NIFIC does through its bond aggregator function is essentially look to, um, I guess, support community housing providers. Um, and that and community housing providers, I think hopefully most people sort of understand their role, I guess, in the, the housing spectrum. Um, but, they're, you know, they're still a relatively nascent sector within Australia. But when you look overseas, particularly to the UK, um, I think there's a, there's a view that they can certainly um, uh, provide a, a greater role. And I think the other thing with community housing providers is that they also provide wraparound services. Um, so it's not just providing the, the actual home, but also uh, support services for a number of the tenants, um, particularly high need tenants, I guess, that need a whole range of additional support to, to help them um, uh, participate in, in society. So uh, in terms of, um, I'm just gonna skip in terms of the NIFIC and maybe just focus mm. on Nathan, I might just get you, let's just remind you to um, also go through the slides that are on your screen. Can you oh, see? do I yep. have to move that as well? Yes, yep, you do. Oh, sorry. My that's point. all right. Thank you. Just check um, that that's working. Yes, that would be, um, <laughs> there we go. There's me. Um, this slide, so. Hang on, where it's not coming through yet. Okay, let's just see if that comes through. No, it's not. Um, so it's just opened in. It's not progressing. Okay. So is there? Um, let me just have a look. Oh, here we go. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Right. Sorry. That's the one. Sorry. Thanks. My mistake. Um, so this this probably gives a, a bit of a, a good structure, I guess, in terms of how the the NIFIC. Uh, functions and in particular I want to sort of bring in the local government um, aspect as well but I think the local government's not just has an interest in this not just from a direct financing point of view but also in terms of improving how, housing outcomes 
um, in in localities. And obviously, when you when you look at say uh, say city of Sydney, for example, you see a lot of emphasis in terms of the provision of um, social and affordable housing. You know, that goes beyond just that sort of I guess that narrow interest in terms of the direct funding source. I think there's a broader you know uh, community um, objective in mind in terms of allowing people a whole spectrum of people to live and work um, particularly in the inner city so in terms of the NIFIC um, the investor mandate I guess straightforward um, so what we have we have a we have an act which has set up the NIFIC and then we have an investment mandate which essentially covers the government's instructions to the to the board in terms of um, what are the particular uh, functions that, that we want to, um, uh, that we're being asked to deliver. And the two key functions are the affordable housing bond aggregator. And the second one is the national housing infrastructure facility. Now we, in addition to that, um, uh, we have access to a couple of different funding sources. So in terms of the, the bond aggregator, the basic idea is with the benefit of a Commonwealth guarantee, we can go out, issue our own bonds, borrow very cheaply and then have essentially a path through model to community housing providers. So, you know, instead of going for a community housing provider, instead of going to a bank and potentially looking at paying five plus percent and only being able to borrow for up to five years, um, they can come to us and uh, on the current interest rate that was offered under the first bond, we lent to them an under 3% for 10 year fixed interest only. And that, that enables them, I guess, to match they're, they're borrowing to, to their assets because typically they're, they're holding homes that obviously have a, a long asset life. And because they have relatively stable but low cash flows because a lot of the, because it's subsidised housing, a lot of the income is coming through, uh, through tenants, um, which in turn comes from Commonwealth support payments, um, actually sort of driving the cost down um, helps um, the CHP sector in terms of increasing the overall yield, which is already low, but it gets it up to a higher level. Um, and certainly what we've seen in terms of some of the initial lending, that sort of the costs associated with refinancing are substantial. So removing that risk is certainly beneficial. And then the direct saving that they're getting in terms of interest cost is certainly making a sizable difference. So we estimate for that first bond, for example, of $315 million, that we ended up saving the CHP sector around $40 million over, over that 10 years for the six, seven um, CHPs that participated in that bond. So that's the bond. And then in addition, we have an infrastructure facility, which is a line of credit. Uh, sorry, we have a line of credit from the, um, from the Commonwealth. What that enables us to do is essentially warehouse community housing provider loans. So um, not, not every CHP is going to be aligned perfectly in terms of their financing need. So what we can do is we can use the line of credit on a, say, a temporary basis. Um, and then when, once we get sufficient scale, we can refinance them out through, um, uh, through the issuance of a bond. In addition, we have the infrastructure facility, which is a $1 billion uh, facility, which is meant to support hard infrastructure to unlock um, new housing supply. Critical to the NIF is this notion of additionality. Um, so we don't want to just come in and displace, I guess, other financiers that we're going to support um, an infrastructure project. We're looking to, um, if, it's, it's, if it's not quite viable, if the financials don't quite stack up, or they don't stack up for a period of time because you know, you're waiting on the state government to, to basically build that pipe past the site, which makes it work. Um, so if there's a bring forward or if there's some sort of uplift in terms of the proportion of affordable housing or community housing. Um, so, you know, some, some areas have inclusionary zoning, um, which, you know, range quite substantially, but let's just say it's 10%. Um, through the provision of this $1 billion uh, through the NIF, you know, if we can basically get an uplift in terms of the proportion to say 15%, that would also satisfy um, the, the additionality concept. So if the bond aggregator is restricted to registered CHPs, the infrastructure facilities is also open to registered CHPs, but it also includes um, local governments and it includes state governments. And if you have one of those three entities setting up an SPV, 
um, to also uh, partner with, say, a, a third party such as a developer, um, then then certainly an SPV uh, can can qualify provided it has one of those parties. The finance, the idea would be that we that we offer some degree of concession to get that to get that project safe. It's not viable to a viable stage, um, so the. We have a, a fair degree, I guess, of um, discretion in terms of working out what that degree of concessionality is. Um, it can be in the form of a lower interest rate. It can be longer tenor. Um, uh, it can be we can capitalise the interest. I guess we have a whole range of, of options. Um, so just in terms of the one billion, um, that comprises loans. It comprises uh, equity. Uh, and if equity can't work in that transaction, we have the ability to just convert that into a loan. And then there's $175 million of grants. And what we have been advocating for is essentially the idea of um, blending the finance. So if we put in some grant money and we put in some loan money, and we'd be looking to say, well, look, the grant money is obviously finite and once it goes, it goes. And we'd be looking to, I guess, as a rule of thumb, you know, what's the bang for for buck that we get for every dollar that we put in, um, in the way of grant money. That's that's the basic the basic idea. Um, just moving if I can. Wrong way. Um, so I've just talked about the NIF. I guess in terms I should have probably moved slides. So sorry again. Um, so as I say, hard infrastructure is available for greenfield, brownfield. Um, it's one billion loans, equity and grants, it's a perpetual fund. So that means it'll continue to exist into the future. But what we have to do is basically grow the principal over time. Um, uh, so, you know, that way the fund grows and there's more money to allocate. Uh, we talked about the concessionality and how it needs to be sort of calibrated. Um, uh, and just the different parties, I guess, that can, that can access um, the fund. We have no geographic because um, that sometimes pops up, I guess, in terms of some of the questions. You know, is there a particular region or do you have some sort of notional allocation? It, it's a national scheme, so I guess we'd certainly be keen to get infrastructure facility across, um, uh, roll that out across all jurisdictions, um, but we don't have any set um, allocations. Wrong way again. Sorry, not doing well at this. Um, Bond aggregator, I've talked about, I guess, in terms of um, how, it, uh, how it works, uh, in terms of the key elements. Um, just in terms of talking about um, that in the interest rate, I guess, which um, has sort of sparked a fair bit of interest. So, uh, and, and I guess the details of that first bond transaction. So it was $315 million was, was the first bond transaction. Um, uh, I guess part of, we were oversubscribed four times. Um, so basically, there was roughly you know 1.2 million of, of 1.2 billion of bids um, for the for the for the 315 million. So there was a lot of demand. Um, I think part of the reason for that demand is you know we have we tick all the boxes in terms of AAA repo eligible high quality liquid assets status. Um, which is very attractive for, for bond investors. So it certainly enables uh, us to um, access funds at a very attractive uh, rate. And we think looking forward, there's certainly potential to keep um, tapping the market to go back, um, you know, once CHPs, I guess, have come to us with their, with their financing needs. I think also the social bond aspect, um, certainly our... Uh, doing this for the first time, I guess we got a very um, uh, good appreciation that there's a huge amount of demand for, for social, uh, social investing. And I guess we would envisage our bonds continuing to be uh, social bonds uh, going forward. So that means that there are a number of um, investment um, funds that have allocated you know, part of their portfolio to invest um, in these sort of bonds. So it certainly benefits us. And certainly when we look at this, the, um, so we priced really well, um, you know, 238, which was um, about 48 basis points above um, Commonwealth government securities, um, which, which we think is very sharp pricing. Um, when you look at the secondary bond market, that's actually come in further. So now I'm told it's trading around 40 
uh, basis points above Commonwealth government security. So looking forward, I'm, I'm sort of hopeful that there's an opportunity to get even better pricing as we build uh, the NIFIC bond as a new asset class um, in Australia. Um, so just in terms of our lending policies, um, I guess uh, so far we've, I guess we've, we've taken a traditional sort of property lend approach. Um, uh, we need to sort of keep thinking about, so that means focusing on LVR and, and ICR, uh, interest cover ratio, loan valuation ratio uh, metrics um, from, a, from a security point of view. Um, I think some of the sort of feedback to date has been that, um, uh, particularly where you've got a Commonwealth um, payment or a state payment such as specialist disability accommodation or a social and affordable housing fund type payment, you might want to think about this as an infrastructure lend. That's something we'll, we'll have a think about. Um, another sort of piece of feedback has been that we, uh, that in terms of partnering with other lenders, other financial providers, that um, they would like to work with us and they could do the construction component and we could do the takeout component at the back end. We do now have a construction policy, as you can see, which refers to, um, again, what we'd be prepared to lend um, for a construction project. Obviously, there's a different set of considerations in terms of um, uh, you know, determining what's appropriate in terms of um, drawdowns and um, uh, you know, what the proportion that we're willing to lend. And then also just having those pre-sales is another important consideration for us. And from what I understand, this is very similar to, to what, um, say, the banks would do when they're sort of providing construction uh, finance. Um, so in, in terms of the, um, I guess, the process, so, and, and, and I guess maybe just to come back to local government and, and what this means for you. So certainly the infrastructure facility is something there for, for I think, for you to consider because um, uh, you're one of the eligible applicants. Um, I know that there are, in looking at what states offer, there are certainly other sources of finance um, uh, that, that you can access. Um, but but we're we're very keen, I guess, to talk with state uh, with local governments to to discuss how the NIFIC could be um, and the NIF in particular could be structured to to assist with um, you know potential uh, greenfield brownfield um, developments that you have in mind. And I think where you where you potentially even though the bond I've talked a bit about the bond aggregator, but I guess I just want to give you a sense that if you do have a community housing provider that is going to come in and potentially um, do some affordable housing, um, that if you have a combination of the infrastructure facility and the bond aggregator working um, through a community housing provider, it can be a very attractive, um, potentially a very attractive um, proposition. And I think also, you know, subject to um, what happens after this weekend, um, you know, there's the prospect of additional support being on the table for community housing providers um, to, to, to further, I guess, make those transactions stack. So we have a process that involves, um, I guess, there's information on our website that relates to both the infrastructure facility and the bond aggregator. And then we have a process whereby you would submit an EOI as the first, you know, um, first stage. It's, it doesn't involve any commitment from the from the applicant, but what it enables us to do is allocate an originator from the NIFIC to reach out and have a chat to you, get further details around the project. And I think just really path, have that first past approach where we can identify before people waste too much time and energy as to whether this, this works potentially. And then we move more into the, you know, before we get to an application stage. And then we really sort of, I guess, drill down into the finer details um, in terms of, of how both the, an infrastructure facility and if it's relevant, a, a, um, a bond aggregator loan would work. Um, I've been through, so that's probably a, that's a grab from our website. Um, in terms of just the, the originators that I mentioned, um, so the first three names are, are basically, they're covering sort of both the bond aggregator and the, um, and the infrastructure facility. Ben 
has just joined us from Lendlease. And um, we've, I've asked him to focus in particular on the infrastructure facility, um, given his background and his ability, I guess, to sort of bring different parties together to structure a transaction. Um, because, it, you know, sometimes it's not obvious, um, uh, you know, to, to stakeholders that have been in this space for quite some time. And our experience to date, because the NIFIC is, so, is still quite new, um, is that um, it's still quite a revelation for a number of people to, to, um, to find out what we potentially offer to help um, uh, structure a deal. So Ben is, is certainly um, there to, to help, not just, you know, once you get to that pass that EOI, but even just to sort of talk conceptually about how we can get a project to the stage where we can bring different parties together to make it stack financially for you. Um, does that, should I pause there? And, yep, um, that, that sounds fantastic. Thank you very much, Nathan. And we will open up to questions, but I just wonder while we wait for people to type their questions into the chat mechanism, um, or, or just let me know you'd like to ask a question and I can unmute you, but could you give us a, an example perhaps of, uh, are there any, um, projects that you've funded that you could just give a, an initial an, an overview of what the components are that um, that might sort of spark that recognition I suppose in some of the local government projects yeah so look I mean the infrastructure facilities on a slightly slower track just I guess the nature of getting everything in place like with bond aggregator obviously we're quite advanced but I can talk sort of at a general level just in terms of what, what we've been looking at to date um, without sort of um, going into specifics. So some of the, some of the types of infrastructure um, could involve, for example, the, the bearing of, of high voltage power lines um, that enables um, more housing sites to, to be available that would have otherwise not been available. Um, there's been discussion around um, uh, some roads, you know, like, um, linking infrastructure both on, on site, but then um, also the linking that infrastructure to the site. Um, another uh, proposal involves, um, you know, potentially a, a water pipe upgrade, which would help unlock uh, that particular site. Um, there's been some remediation um, discussion. So in, in some cases, community housing providers um, are given a site that, um, it's, it's, it's relatively, um, whether they're gifted or they get a fairly um, uh, disc, heavily discounted uh, price attached to it, uh, but it, it typically needs quite a bit of um, site remediation. Um, they've probably been some of the examples that we've, that we've been having a look at to date. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, Phil. Phil, um, could you introduce yourself and ask your question, please? Mm. Phil, can you hear me and can you ask your question? It looks like you're unmuted. No. Sorry. Perhaps is there someone else who'd like to ask a question while we try and figure out Phil's audio? Okay. Try again, Phil. No, sorry, Phil, still can't hear you. Do you want to type your question in and I can ask it for you? Um, in the meantime, Nathan, um, can you tell us a bit about how the um, your organisation is structured. So how, how much of it is fund management, I suppose, versus um, that project management side of things? 
Um, sorry, just so I understand. So, uh, do you mean? So, how, so you said you, that you're obviously, um, you know, you've got a perpetual fund to manage. Yep. So that's, um, you know, obviously a really important part of your organisation. But is that managed with in house or? Um, you know, so how much of it is looking after the money and how much of it is um, allocating the money? Yeah, so um, essentially it's the same team of people. So we have, uh, the way we're structured, we have a team of originators. Um, there's roughly um, four of them. Uh, we have a credit team. So the origination team will basically work with project proponents through the uh, through the loan application process, and then it'll then be handed off to um, to credit to independently uh, verify um, and potentially go through uh, a credit committee that we have, which has external um, uh, experts, credit experts attached to it, um, and then it'll go on to um, onto the board uh, for decision. So. The I guess in terms of the NIFIC, and I mean, it's obviously still a work in progress because we're relatively new, but certainly the emphasis has been on, on building the origination and the credit team um, so that in terms of our decision-making process, we can have the confidence that, um, uh, you know, in, in taking uh, decisions around um, transactions, we have a very sound credit um, uh, basis to those decisions. The, the legal, I guess the legal dimensions is probably another area that we're focused on building because every transaction has a, um, obviously there are contracts and, and uh, legal dimensions. Um, and then I think the, the other aspect that we have is essentially, um, I guess our interaction with, with government. So uh, we have a small team of people that uh, I guess we've been using to reach out to people like yourself, to talk with state governments, to talk with the Commonwealth government, um, because I guess we're at the nexus, um, you know, in terms of how the Commonwealth has particular housing initiatives, same with the state, and then obviously the local government um, has have housing initiatives, but also at that sort of very practical level, uh, sort of uh, essentially involved in land release and, and working with developers and essentially working with the same stakeholders that we have an interest in. Okay. Does that help? Yep, thank you. We're about 20 people in okay. at this point. Yep, okay. And, and so what's what's the reaction been from state government? Are they um, seeing how this integrates with their uh, priorities and, and are, are they a good applicant, in, in, I suppose? Yeah, so I think I think certainly on the infrastructure facility, there's there's certainly a, a, a um, I think a good degree of interest um, in terms of how the infrastructure facility can be used, um, and I think our initial focus has been, um, in particular, talking to state governments, so looking at particular initiatives that they have in mind and how we could work together to try and leverage an outcome. Um, but I, I think my sense is there's a lot more that we can do with the local government sector. Um, and we're certainly, I mean, we, get, we need to get the message out, but then I think we also need to probably um, sit down and, and probably work through some practical examples because it's still quite, it can be challenging, I guess, to, to unless you take it down to a practical level to understand how this could work. Yeah, sure. Um, okay, I've just got another question here. Um, so information about the grants in particular for around the NIF, yep. um, what sort of um, percentage is required for self-funding? So what sort of contributions are required and, and is there some more information that we could get, um, can't seem to see it on the website straight away, but just specifically about the grants? Yeah, so the grant... Um uh, it's sort of covered, I guess, in the infrastructure facility briefing more broadly. Um, but look, it's, I guess, the basic, the basic approach we have, because it, it's, it's finite, once it goes, it's gone, um, is that we want to blend that with, say, the loan financing 
and try and extract the most, the, the most possible leverage for that for every dollar that we put in into a particular project. Um, so if, if, if this is just all hypothetical, right? So if, if you come to us and ask for grant money and we work out that the grant money is potentially, you know, you're putting in $10 million of grant money to unlock, say, 10 properties, that's probably not a great value for money proposition. But if we can put in, say, $10 million worth of grant, blend that with some loan money, uh, also from the infrastructure facility, and we can unlock, say, 150 or 200 properties, then that's a much better proposition. So it's really that bang for your buck. For every dollar we put in, what and blending that with loans, concessional loans, what can we potentially unlock in terms of new housing supply? Mm. And so I suppose that's, you know, councils, local government needs to be considering this quite early in their in their thinking. Um, and, you know, is it worth uh, some councils who might have particular projects or developments in mind having a conversation with Ben, uh, you know, just to see how, you know, they could structure that financing component? Absolutely. I, I think, you know, on a no commitment, confidential basis, we can have a conversation with um, local councils um, and if there are other parties, uh, other stakeholders, um, just sit down and basically uh, workshop, you know, whiteboard basically different options. Um, some, in some cases, it, it's not going to, to work, but we think, we, we think there's a lot of potential to get particular yeah. projects to stack from our perspective. Yeah, great. Okay, Phil, do you want to try again? If not, type your question. Phil? I can sort of almost hear you. Do you want to yell? <laughs> oh, okay. Is that better? Than I was no, it's not better. No. Okay, look, briefly, I just wanted to ask around community housing. Providers. Community housing, yep. Uh, and the stock transfers that have occurred. No, I missed it. Stock transfers, I think. Soft transfers. Yes, yeah. transfers. Transfer of housing stock. In public housing authorities to community housing providers. So transfer of housing stock from community, no, from, no, from public housing to community housing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, is there money available for urban renewal, noting that community housing providers get a 75% discount on their rates in South Australia, and it doesn't make them very popular with us at local government level? So that was around that transfer of ownership and urban renewal. Is that right, Phil? And and so there's a rates discount for transfer community housing. And, and the fact that community housing providers only pay 25% of the rate at local government level in South Australia. Okay, so Nathan, perhaps, you know, have you come across in different states these different regulations around ownership and uh, and rates and <laughs> I know in WA as well there's you know, different facilities available. Oh, hang on, I just got a lot of noise through from Phil's microphone. <laughs> Look, I think one of the concerns, um, if I'm right, um, but I guess it's probably not within our remit, but I guess some of the concerns I've heard is that by having the CHPs, deliver some of this housing, um, they're not paying rates and therefore it's a lost revenue to the local government. Is that is that right? Yeah, I think I think so. I think that's what he was saying. Yes, that's yeah. what it is. Yes, that's what it is. That money. Is there a way to make up that money through the fund and work collaboratively with the community housing providers? Um Look, I, I'm, I'm not sure, because um, I think if I heard you correctly, you said, is there a way to make up the money? Um, so I, I, I'm not sure we're in a position to sort of, I guess, subsidise rates. Um, I guess we'd have to have a look at, you know, the particular project, if there's a CHP that's doing a development in, in particular local government. Um, 
I guess we just have to have a look at the finer detail, but I, I don't envisage that we'd be in a position to subsidise rate, loss rate revenue. Okay, thank you. We've just got a follow up from Melton around the grants question. Um, so if there was a project, for example, where council was making a significant contribution as well, um, so they're not necessarily looking for a loan as well as the grant, would, would you still advise a conversation or, or would there be another department that they can go I, looking for? I think we're, we're happy to have a conversation. Um, uh, I think it's just going to be more challenging if you just, because, I mean, you can imagine the, the situation, right? So as soon as you mention grants, everyone just goes straight yeah. for grants. Um, <laughs> so, so I guess what we're trying to do is stretch the grants as far as possible. But look, we're happy to have a conversation. There might be other, um, there might be other funding sources that, um, uh, like, you know, we could think about in terms of trying to help transactions stack. Um, which could also involve the grant source when you look at, say, what state governments are potentially putting on the table, depending on the jurisdiction. Um, so, you yeah, know, happy to have a conversation and then we can go from there. Okay, very good. Right, well, I'm noticing that our time is nearly up. So um, I'll just give one last chance for people to send any questions through on chat. Um, okay, here's another one. Um, so this is from the city of Whittlesea um, and it says, I've just lost it, just a moment. Our council uh, has negotiated the inclusion of social and affordable housing as part of a large development, 3,000 dwellings on an old TIP site. The developer has partnered with a CHP who will manage 300 um, social and affordable units. Is this the type of project that the NIF could provide funding to via an SPV to make sure the land is appropriate for development? Yeah, I'm just reading that. Yeah, um, it's a big question. So thanks, Joe, for that. Yeah, I think um, definitely. Uh, I'm just looking at that now. I, I think that is definitely something that would be within scope, whether you need an SPV to sort of uh, for that arrangement. But I think the notion that um, you have a developer, uh, there has to be that sort of uh, some um, inclusionary zoning and you have bring in a CHP. I think the, the CHP through being able to access the bond aggregator and potentially the infrastructure facility can, can basically help those transactions stack. Um, so I think, I think it's definitely worth having a conversation. Okay, yep, great. Um, and another question here, um, are there any names of the CHPs that have been successful in funding or in getting the grants? So is there anything you can show us that we can look into and explore? Yeah, so so when we issued the first... Um, uh, so in terms of CHP successful in funding, yes, on the bond aggregator side. On the infrastructure facility, um, uh, so we, we're still to, to get the first deal away. Some, some deals are are quite advanced, but we haven't reached financial close. Um, okay. But but we put out an ad in the AFR uh, following the bond uh, launch that named the CHPs, among others. Um, yep. So just off the top of my head, it was um, it was Hume, uh, it was uh, Blue Chip, um, it was Evolve, uh, Compass, um, who else? Um, Unity from South Australia. Possibly one other, but they're the ones that come okay. to mind. Okay, thank you. We can look more into that. Um, and I think that's, that's the last of the questions that have come in. Um, and we've got one minute left in our allocated time. So that sounds perfect. Um, Nathan, I'd like to thank you for your time. I know we've we've had a separate meeting a couple of months back as well. And I think I'm really keen to try and connect up some of our member councils um, with your team. So it sounds like there might be a couple of ideas there that we can pursue. Um, any closing comments from you, Nathan? Oh, look, I think... Um so from the NIFIC point of view, uh, I guess we're sort of on a trajectory that involves us doing um, 
uh, what we envisage a lot more business. So I think the announcements uh, this week, um, there's certainly the financing arm, but there's also this supply council uh, uh, initiative, you know, that I think, again, just, so I, I like to continue talking with, with those that are interested in terms of what we can offer from a financing point of view, but I think there's also an opportunity to actually have a broader conversation around, you know, improving housing outcomes um, and how we get different layers of government to work together to achieve that. Um, and because uh, both sides have come out supporting that initiative. So, uh, and NIFIC has been sort of slated to, to basically work on this issue. So I'd be very keen to continue a dialogue that also looks at the underlying constraints to, to new housing supply and how all different levels of government can work together. It sounds great. And I know it's certainly a priority for quite a few of our, um, um, with, for quite a few of our councils. And so um, thank you for that. And thank you very much for your time. And um, NGAA members, this will be um, the recording of this and the Nathan's presentation will be put on our members page in our website. So if you wanted to share it with any of your colleagues, please do. And please make sure you get in touch with Nathan or I or Ben Nicholson um, from the team or any of those other contacts that Nathan suggested. Um, and we can hopefully get something happening through a growth area. That'd be great. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Thanks, everyone.